Shom Rabyug. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to the tiny room. Welcome back to On Shom Rabyug. I am the newly christened Mike of Michael and Benjamin's podcast, just so that we can say the phrase Mike on the mic. And I am joined by the man who is known in another fabulous in-joke as Benjamin Biggish Hands Collopy. <laughs> it's Benjamin Biggish Hands Collopy. Yeah, they are fairly meaty for a man of my size. Yeah, you've got a normal size hand on a tiny body. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it is. That's what it is. Only one part of you came out okay. <laughs> Your biggish hands. Benjamin, yes. people aren't here to listen to this sort of shite talk. They're here to listen about comic books and whatnot. Yeah. So why don't you put on a theme music for them? <gasps> The music for the podcast We don't actually have any music Very good, very amusing. Benjamin, speaking of both theme music and buttery smooth segues Yes, which you are you he- renowned for Exactly. Have you heard of the Linda the Policewoman controversy? No very good. Okay, that leads what is, me. What is Linda the police? Linda woman? the police woman is a Hungarian TV series. Oh no! From communist era Hungary, um, from nineteen eighty four. Okay. And the theme music has recently come to light. I'm going to do. I'm going to break one of the golden rules of podcasting now and play this on my phone for you to listen to and do a live reaction. Okay. Are you ready? Yes. Linda the police woman, nineteen eighty four. Bear with me. That's not Linda the Policewoman. Yes, it is. But then that means the other show isn't... What? All your X-Men figurines have turned their heads away in shame, Michael. Benjamin, do you want to summarize? You, I'd like I'd like the listeners to have a visual description of what your face looked like. There. <laughs> it was like if you put a small weight attached to a hook in my bottom lip. <laughs> and let it go. My my jaw just hit the floor. That's ridiculous, Michael. Isn't that that's, good? That's X. That's nineties X Men. The cartoon, isn't it? But in Hungary, in Hungary, in nineteen eighty four, about a lady policewoman. That's oh, that's that's hard to argue against. That's isn't uh, it? even like the pitch. The tempo, the shrillness, like it's oh, it's good. Though, oh. isn't it? But look, it's probably not a case of um, direct stealing. It's probably an overlap. It's probably you know you hear something and you forget you've heard. What's that called? You know when you hear something and you forget. It's the thing that subconscious they, copying. <laughs> yeah, it's the thing that a lot of comedians explain why they've stolen jokes. By oh yeah, it's like, oh well, you know you listen you to know, so many jokes know. and sometimes you don't know what you're. you're yeah, I'm bloody Dane Cook. I'm just bloody stealing jokes and forgetting about it. And then talking about Christian stuff as if it's normal. Um, yeah, bloody so that, that, that's uh, that's from 1984, and that's been as you know several years before the X-Men cartoon came out, but about the right amount of time before to inspire a theme tune if, say, two of the composers happened to be in Eastern Europe and heard it. On the TV late night in their in their hotel one time. I'm not bloody saying that that's what happened, Ben. I'm saying it might have been, though. I'm not privy to that kind of information. But it might have been, though. It might have been. It might, unfortunately, sully the legacy of the greatest team music ever recorded. Ah, nah. We just forget about Linda Policewoman. Yeah, get out of here, Linda. Get out of here, Linda. I'm sure Linda the Policewoman sounds cooler in Hungarian. I certainly hope it does. (laughs) What are you doing on Friday night, Ben? (laughs) Stay in and watch Linda the Policewoman. (laughs) I can't wait. Episode (laughs) 4. Episode 4. Linda has a tough day at work. (laughs) I didn't know where you were going with it when you started playing it. I was like, I don't know what this is supposed to sound like. And yeah, I'm... no, it's the it's, uh, 90s X-Men theme tune. Yeah, that's gas. Isn't it? Gas. Yeah, that was, that was, that was all. I just wanted to get a little shock out of you there. Ben, are you excited about the upcoming Crisis on Infinite Earths TV crossover? No. Good. All right, well, let's move uh, on then. Let's move on then. Now, I mean, I, what I'm really enjoying, Michael, because I'm a committed DC fanboy, as you know, I'm really enjoying all the different costumes popping up. I enjoy that I know where those costumes are coming from. Very good. I enjoy the in-jokes that the industry's making, because the Huntress is going to wear the Huntress suit from the, the terrible, the Birds, terrible of Birds of Prey show a couple of years ago. Um, and she's determined to wear it. And everyone's like, oh. You're going to wear it, are you? Yeah, she's like, yeah, I'm going to wear it. Yeah, it Did you see even the set photos? There's an on-set photo of a newspaper which reveals that Michael Keaton's Batman married Catwoman. 
No. Yeah. <laughs> really? <laughs> it's, yeah. It's look. It's Fanboy Central, Ben. Ah. It's going to be very exciting. Fanboys galore. It's it's of course, Ben. Mere hours after we record this, Batwoman is going to debut on the CW. Yes, it's, the first review seems a little. The few first few reviews I've read are a little bit neg- negative. Negative. Sorry, my mouth just kind of tried to catch up what my brain was thinking. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm still, yeah, I'm still hooked on Linda Policewoman. Linda the Policewoman. Oh, sorry, Linda the Policewoman. Her name isn't Linda the Policewoman. <laughs> I quite hope it is, though. Hello, Miss Policewoman. That's Officer Policewoman to you. That's Policewoman, Policewoman to you, mister. You're under sexy arrest. In a kind of 1984 Hungary sort of way. No, no, no. So, yeah, no, it's going to be exciting. I'm very excited. Uh just because the sheer ridiculousness of the amount of people they've managed to capture and get involved it's in actually this. actually mad. Like, it's, the cast is huge. It's uh, Surely the lady who played Huntress in the 90s Birds of Prey TV show is going to have little more than a non-speaking cameo. Like, how can they get all these characters in it? There's no way they can squeeze them all in. She'll just appear for a second. They'll probably do one of those things where, like, there's a, a multiverse event and there's, like, a light in the sky and they'll do a few and characters look looking up yeah, in their different up. realities. Yeah. It's definitely what's happening. Do you do know that. I'd love to see, like... Go on. One of my favourite characters from Smallville, Michael Rosenbaum, Lex Luthor. Michael Rosenbaum, on his podcast, I believe, revealed that he was asked to do it, but they couldn't tell him when they'd need him. They couldn't tell him how long they'd need him for. They couldn't tell him how much they would pay him. And he said, well, look, that doesn't sound terribly interesting to me. And then said no. But, Fair. you know, that might be dis- dissemination. Perhaps a, a smoke screen a or smoke two. Screen, a ruse. A ruse. As, as a works. classic Lex so Luthor knows, ruse. It could, be, it could be. But Ben, look, I would love if they dropped a big bomb. Like, imagine if they got Cavill or oh. Momoa or something. <laughs> That would be absolutely Just hilarious. Right in the middle. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What the heck? What the fuck? <laughs> Momoa. Be brilliant. What are you ben, doing here? Speaking of uh, universes only tangentially cr- connected to their big screen universes. I love that. Did you see the trailer for Marvel's Cloak and... No, not Cloak and Dagger. Marvel's Runaways Season 3. Buttery smooth, Michael. I know, I know. Look, I've been thinking about it all week. That's not even your cheap, low-end little butter. That's like, <laughs> that's high-end Kerrygold exported gold. Look, I'm going to go on a limb here and say that the butter in the little is probably producing the same factory as the high, the high, the expensive stuff. Almost certainly, Michael. Industrial uh, farming uh, and consumerism is a rampant, rampant pox. But at least it's not margarine. At least it's not that. Um, yeah, Runaway Season 3. Did you see it? I think we both know the answer to that one, Michael. So I'm just going to sit here and uh, watch you spin your wheels. It seems to be about Nico Minoru. She's moving more towards being an actual sorcerer rather mm-hmm. than just a person who has a, ma- a technologically powered staff. Oh, we're going to have a real magic. Dark magic. Liz Hurley is in it as a sexy older lady. <sighs> oh, I might have to watch it now. I might have to watch oh. it. She's a sexy older sorcerer that with is... a low cut top, Ben. Oh. And she's like, Ew, you, you think that you'll get away from me, but you can't because I'm too sexy. Oh, I think I'm into that now. <laughs> That's my Liz uh, Hurley impression. Right. You would just pause the podcast there or spin yeah, your wheels. I'm just going to nip downstairs <laughs> and <laughs> check out the trailer. Uh, she's... She She's, yeah, she looks like she's going to be some sort of villain, or as you would say, villain. Villain. And then, Ben, a little surprise twist, Cloak and Dagger are going to appear <gasps> in a little crossover event. Dun, dun, dun. Yeah, not quite big. Not, not quite, quite as big as Infinite Crisis. No, <laughs> but still, exciting. Benjamin. Yes. It has been quite the week for TV pilots. We're in TV pilot season. Are we in TV pilot season? I think we are, because I watched a TV pilot yesterday, and I wasn't sure whether it was in our wheelhouse. So I'm going to tell you what it was, and then you tell me if you think it's in our wheelhouse. I almost will, certainly, Michael, because it's been a a slow week, and we need context. (laughs) (laughs) No, I've remembered a lot of things now. Go on. I didn't have a dagger on our list. These are not not in the run order. No, they're not at all. I'm kind of freewheeling it here. Freewheeling, and I am nervous. I'm sweating. What I saw this week was... uh, was the, the, the pilot episode of the new CW series, Nancy Drew. Oh. Does that... Does that it's look, in our wheelhouse. Isn't it? It's fiction. It's fiction. It's a bit supernatural. It's nostalgic fiction. There's, yeah. a little bit of, there's a little bit of chicanery going on. Then I didn't like it. I wouldn't have thought you were the key demographic for no. a Nancy Drew CW show. But is it a sexy Nancy Drew? Yes, oh. it is. The very first scene oh. is her having sex with a man. Oh, for God. I'm going to have a look now. Hang on. It's, and, you know, there's a, a, multi-eth- a multi-ethnic cast of very attractive people. Well, that's important. And they've all got dark secrets, Ben. But yeah, it's, it's Riverdale, but for... It's Riverdale by way of Veronica Mars, but without the teeth of Veronica Mars. Oh, well, that's good. Nancy Drew is not a very pleasant character. 
Your cats are having my a cats fit are having out a, there. They're going I'm mad. Very I don't know what's wrong with them? them. Um, she's a very blonde lady. She's very um, well. She's a redhead in the show. Oh, she's a, okay. The lady who plays Nancy Drew, whose name I didn't catch. The sexed up Nancy is unrecognizable, is what it says here. Is the top review? <laughs> yeah, that sounds about right. Um, Kennedy McCann, which is the most American name yeah, I think I've ever heard. They're both surnames, Ben. Kennedy McCann. They're yeah. both Irish Scottish surnames yeah. as well. Like that's that. like being called bloody Leonard Colopy. Oh, that could, work, <laughs> that could actually work just fine. That's fine that's name. That's what that's we'll actually... call our. That's what we'll call our first child, Ben. <laughs> Oh god. Anyway, yeah, I, uh, look, I can't strongly recommend it. It's like um Veronica Mars s- merged inexplicably with a Victorian ghost story but set in an American town in the 50s, but it's actually now. Oh, that's not good. Yeah. It's a hodgepodge. It's a hodgepodge. Then a Colopy's a great name. <laughs> <laughs> that's there. what we should have called the production company. <laughs> Leonard Colopy. Yeah. Look, Ben. It's strong. Nancy Drew, I don't recommend it. I can't recommend it personally. But you know what else people don't recommend, Ben? Go on. Going to see the film Will Smith's The Gemini Man. I wouldn't imagine they do. <laughs> oh, Bloody. hold on. I forgot to do my thing where I give a film a, the, a kind of funny name. Off you go. Uh, people have forgotten to go see uh, Will Smith's new film. There's two Will Smiths. <laughs> the, the King and I, man. Um, yeah, it just... Uh, look, I said it to you, Michael, when I first saw the, the advertisement for this. Basically... After how Earth. many Will Smiths are there? How many Will Smiths are there? <laughs> There's two of them. That's all Will Smith has ever wanted, is to play <laughs> in a movie with himself. That's all he's ever wanted. I'm a big fan of Will Smith. Early yeah. Will Smith is, is just peak entertainment. Yeah. Very charismatic man. He was the Jason Momoa or Chris Pratt of his time. Yeah, East Philadelphia born and raised. East Philadelphia born and raised. On the playground is where he spent most, most of his days. Until he became an international superstar. Yeah, and then he kind of Hollywood. moved along from there. Yeah. But I always remember watching AE After Earth. For those not in the know, you know, the That's classic, good. the cult, the cult classic. Um, With the best character name of all time. <laughs> what was his name? Cypher Rage. Cypher Rage. <laughs> it's just awful. Stupid name. Um, but it's just him and his son and it's Will Smith's little vanity project. And now he's figured out a way to get rid of his son. Yeah, don't need him. Cut out a paycheck and it's just cloning himself. How many Will Smiths are there? There's two Will Smiths. I'm not sure that that's CGI. I think it might just be another Will Smith. I think he might have cracked the code. It's de-aging. Ben, do you think that that film is going... We haven't seen it. We haven't seen it. It is out. But we're we haven't not seen going it. to see it either, Michael. Do you think that the twist at the end is going to be that there's loads of them? Yeah, there's a just... It's, it's going to find a classic factory. thing where they like pull the lever on the thing and you just say, oh, damn. And, there's and this of is going to be tons of tanks lighting up slowly. And some of them are real gnarly. Yeah, some of them are all, some are failed experiments. all funked up. All funked up. And then a little Easter egg for the fans. One of them is Carlton. <laughs> I want to go see it now. <laughs> Let's go see it. Why aren't we? Why aren't we working in Hollywood, Michael? I'm just. Saying. I'm telling you. Look, this kind of twist. Let's, this is what people want. We do fan service like nobody's business. How many Will Smiths are there? Doesn't matter. There's Carlton. There's a, one Carlton, and everyone would leave that movie going, "Oh, that Carlton!" Remember when Carlton was? Remember in when it? Carlton was in it? Everybody loves a bit Carlton. <laughs> anyway, anyway, Ben, look, it has bombed. It's earned about 19 oh, really? million at the box office on its opening weekend. That's unusual for Will Smith. He doesn't normally tank. People didn't care about this. It's just, a, but it does seem just like a huge vanity project of Will Smith doing his low chin tilt, furrowed brow kind mm-hmm. of like, I need to fix this. Yeah, I don't know if Bad Boys 3 is going to do well either. I think we're also entering. Known as Martin Lawrence fully transforms into Big Mama. <laughs> I had a dream last night in which. I watched Bad Boys 1 and 2, having not seen them, and Martin Lawrence was jacked. <laughs> I was like, well, he really let himself go in three. And then I woke up and said, that was an odd <laughs> podcast-related dream. Why am I dreaming about Martin Lawrence's <laughs> degradation? Jacked bod. Yeah, it's weird. He's not jacked in 1 and 2. No, <laughs> I, no I know he isn't. But he was like Further a little... proof that you've not seen those He films. was like a little tiny bodybuilder. He was like shirtless for most of the film. What the heck is going on here? To be fair, Martin Lawrence really does give off the energy of a short bodybuilder. Where yeah. it seems like a small puppy that's been slightly irritated. And he's like, hey, hey, look at me, I'm big. <laughs> look, at, look at my I'm muscles. I've got the... I think that's Martin Lawrence's whole, whole career is just the, the energy of a Napoleonic complex bodybuilder. <laughs> a lot of Martin Lawrence's shtick has been stolen by um, that little short guy from Jumanji. Kevin Hart. Kevin Hart, yeah. Who was also known as Martin Lawrence's pretty much long lost cousin. Oh, is he? Yeah, <laughs> no, yeah, he's not yeah, really, yeah, but yeah, like, look, it's pretty much the same thing. He's, he's stolen the shtick. A lot yeah. of the shtick. Do you think that Will Schmidt... Will Schmidt. <laughs> the German version, yeah. No, the German Wilhelm version. Wilhelm Schmidt. <laughs> Wilhelm Schmidt. Oh, damn! <laughs> 
What is going on here with all of these clones of myself? In the Gemini hair. <laughs> yes, I, my name is Wilhelm Smith in West Berlin. I was raised. Behind the, the wall is where I spent oh, most geez. of my days. <laughs> That's a bit too much. No chilling out. There's work to be done. Until my mama said, you're going to spend some time in Switzerland with your auntie and uncle. <laughs> Bernhard and Hildegard. That's enough of Wilhelm Schmidt, Ben, our famous character, Wilhelm Schmidt. What's going on? What are we doing? Why am I? Why are we riffing on Wilhelm Schmidt instead of talking about the topic? Do you think Will Smith, Will Smith, that's hard to say now that we've committed to Wilhelm Schmidt. <laughs> Go on, just spit the water all over yourself. Just do it. Do you think that, uh, just, we'll just give Ben a little minute here to catch up. You really enjoyed that, didn't you? you <laughs> he's got, <laughs> Oh, you son of a bitch. Now you're making me laugh. Swallow the water, Ben. <laughs> oh, Jesus. Podcast gold. Ben, do you think that Will Smith is undergoing the stage of every Hollywood actor's career where they're on a downturn before the inevitable Will Renaissance? Uh, yeah, I think we're probably... Yeah, we're, we're, we're lining up for a reconnaissance. <laughs> Big time. Wilhelm Schmidt. Um, we're going for a full-on reconnaissance. <laughs> Um, where he just takes on a really serious role and people are like, what a revelation. But wow, well, I had done no that, idea. He's he was in Head Injury, the film. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. He was in... Uh, was he in... What was he in that was serious? That one... Oh, no, that wasn't serious. The one where... Collateral everyone, Beauty or something like that. Yeah, the one where everyone was lying to him. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But like, no good. Get out of here with that. No good. That wasn't I think <clears throat> what might be happening in those cases is that Will Smith is a man who doesn't actually have a, a good range. sense of what drama is. Possibly. And I think he gets handed projects like that, which are basically rom-coms with extra steps. Yeah. And he's just like, yeah, this is deep. I like this. He was in Pursuit of Happiness. That was pretty good. That was, yeah. Again, famous vanity project where he and his son just picked up a hefty, hefty paycheck. Mm. Um, I think Will Smith can act, but I just think it's it's not something that he's in. I look forward to a reconnaissance. I'd like to see that. Someone else has gone through one. At the minute, I can't remember who it was. Someone's making a comeback. Someone's been cast in a very serious movie who wouldn't traditionally be. Oh, um, Adam Sandler's going to be in a Safdie's Brother movie. If if you're into indie cinema and kind of gritty, realistic, then I am not grungy hip hop cinema. Mm-hmm. The Safdie Brothers are are quite important in that genre. Um, one of them being called Good Time with Robert Pattinson. Oh, um, it's a very kind of gritty film. But they're going to be in a new one called Uncut Gems, and he plays um. Adam Sandler plays a diamond dealer who's in who's in deep with the mob. Oh, is, uh, is he South African? Uh, no, he's not. No, he's not a he's not a classic DiCaprio. Blood diamond. <laughs> Blood diamond. Anyway, look, Ben. One of the reasons that there's so many Will Smiths has bombed at the box office is uh, Joaquin Phoenix is going mad. Has done very well. Very well, beating all expectations. Yeah, knocked out the park. Which there's already talk of a sequel, Michael. It doesn't. It doesn't need or justify a sequel. It doesn't it, need or justify a sequel. Tall, but we'll get one. Four hundred million U.S. dollars. Now, Michael, as you know, I'm not good with figures, mm-hmm. so you're going to have to help me out there. Is that good? Four hundred million dollars for f- dollars for an R-rated movie in the first week of October is very good. Okay, it's not Avengers money. So few things by are any right stretch. Though. Yeah, exactly. Very few things are, but it's not Avengers money by any stretch of the imagination. But it may well it may approach a billion. It might, wow! It might break through a billion in the long run. It's kind of Venom money. Oh, Venom money, okay. You know, it's, it's, it's that's not, pretty big money. It's walking around money. It's it's, like, um, yeah, it's and considering that it probably wasn't a terribly expensive film to make, oh, relatively little CGI. But also a lot of closed room shots. Closed rooms, uh, it's, in, it's in a city, a normal city. You yeah, know, it's, uh, I'd say the most expensive scene in that movie is the opening scene with the sign. Cause it where he runs through the city. He's running through New York. Or the subway. I don't know, Ben, I don't know. I don't know. They might have built some sets. Who knows, Ben? Who we don't knows, know. We don't Michael? know. Who knows? Did you see the... Sorry to divert you here. Did you see right. the CGI breakdown for Spider-Man Far From Home? No. Michael, Ridiculous. Massive portions of that film are entirely CG. You know the scene where he goes to the abandoned warehouse and... Yeah. That scene is almost entirely CG. Really? Almost entirely CG. That's fantastic. Isn't that... And not just the bits... No, no, no. In the the dream world. Yeah, yeah. That warehouse doesn't exist. Wow. Isn't that 
mad. <laughs> That's insane. <laughs> Isn't it? But speaking of insane, Ben, yeah. you have some thoughts on Joker. Uh, well, last week, Michael, I was in a very bad mood. When you were, Joker. remember, you I got all scrappy. Yeah. You, um, hadn't even, you hadn't even thought of your new character, Wilhelm Schmidt. No, that made me so happy, Michael. <laughs> I, I think I might actually do a poster when I go home. Um, <laughs> for Wilhelm Schmidt starring in... <laughs> the, the What would he be in? The Fresh Prince of... Burn. The fresh baron of burn. Yeah, nice. <laughs> um, but yeah, something like that. Anyway, um, I've been giving it some thought, Michael. Go on. And I, I, I've been trying to place why it irked me quite so much. Yeah, wiggle your thought muscles there. And I think you're absolutely right when you say the character is definitely not played sympathetically. Yeah. Um, however, go on. I do not think it's condemned enough in what he does and there's too much wiggle room for people to read into Michael. And this is where our topic from this week has come from. But we'll get to that in a second. But I think there's too much space to be interpreted there for people to take the wrong message from that film right and while i don't think in, it's in any way intentional that uh joaquin phoenix plays him with any kind of sympathy i don't think there's anything there there's something about the film that doesn't condemn it in the right way and i'm not saying that's the responsibility of the film no i'm just saying it's it, that's what irked me i think it's too open to interpretation interestingly michael go on um, a friend of you and I that we work with yes. went to see the film. Right. And she went to see the film. A lady. A lady. And she went to see the film um, and it turns out there was a guy in, yeah, the film in the film who was one of those guys cheering when the Joker uh, murdered people. He was like, yeah! And he was like really into it. So much so that she left with 10 minutes to go in the film. Mm. He was so agitated and aggressive about it. Remember how much we laughed and cheered when Rambo killed everyone in Rambo? I wasn't there. Were you not there? No, I wasn't there. Did you not come to see I Rambo? I wasn't there, no. We did laugh and cheer a lot when was Rambo that collective? killed everyone. Was that collective? I don't think it was collective for the entire cinema. Oh, no. that's, bro- that's bad. That's not great. <laughs> but the thing is, Rambo doesn't have that attachment with a very sp- particular subset. You know, there's an argument to be made that, you know, maybe assuming that a person who finds a catharsis in a mad person getting revenge on the world, assuming that they're maladjusted. Mm. But you, wait, no, hang on. you need to go over that again? I missed it. I'm saying that there might be a bit of prejudice involved in oh, being, okay. being frightened of someone who enjoys a movie. Yeah, all right, fair enough. I think it's probably just, there's a lot of connotations that go with the Joker as a character at this point. Yeah, and, but that's what I'm saying. A lot of connotations yeah. which... Uh, that that what you've what you've described there is prejudice. Yeah, fair enough. You're basing on what you've heard on the internet and what you think about a subset of people. Yeah, and thinking, oh, someone's enjoying this. I probably should get out of here because it's not safe. That, in mm. a lot of ways, is some of what's fueling the success of this movie. Oh, I think it absolutely is. I the think kind it's of, such a divisive The film. sense of danger and the sense of fear and the sense of this is a damaging thing to society. Even noted rubbish Irish critic Donald Clark who only pats Irish films on the back now and then. We don't like him, do we? Uh, he just, he only he only did lauds he, Irish films. Did and he irk us at some stage? Bashes everything else. He said something about Infinity War. Oh, did he? <laughs> the very cheek of the him. The very cheek of How him. How very dare he? Yeah, but I think he just bashed it with no... It's, it's like when Martin Scorsese recently said that there's no... I've never seen these, but I know they're not good. Exactly. Like, I, I, he, he just came out and said, um, no Marvel movie is art. And then he was asked, why do you think that? And he goes, oh, I haven't seen them. Yeah. And it's just like, Martin, can you... Yeah, but I am Marty, a 70-year-old man. I don't have time. Marty? Like, Marty, can you say really, that? Marty? I mean... I'm walking here, When Marty. your films came out, they were just gangster films. Yeah. Like, crime films. Like, let's not... Let's Which not was de rigueur of the time. Do you know what I mean? Like, they were just 50 leftovers. 50 leftovers. Like, you can't say that, Martin. De rigueur of the time. Imagine, Ben, in 30 years when cinema has slid down in quality even further. And yeah. Joss Whedon is making art house superhero films and everyone's like now that's real filmmaking that's art <laughs> art anyway go on what were you saying about Joker I've derailed um, you anyway um, no I just think that's what irked me the most is that it's too interpretable or it's too any film is interpretable I'm not arguing that for a second mm-hmm. but what I mean is it's too yeah it's too cathartic in that way it allows too much to happen again I don't think it's in any way glorifying incel culture. I don't think it glorifies violence against women. I read some of the, the feminist reviews and things like that after we went to see the film. Mm-hmm. And they all seem to be people that haven't seen the film yeah. and are saying that it automatically glorifies violence against women. There's very little violence against women in that film. Oh, there's a good bit. 
there's only one confirmed. Well, there's two. The two mother's confirmed. mother. Spoilers. Spoilers. Oh, yeah. Spoilers. Um, Sorry, spoilers. <laughs> there's, yeah, there's his mother. The mother's mother, yeah. Uh, when his mother's his mother. <laughs> <laughs> he have been sitting on that one for a while. No, I just thought of it now. Oh, it was excellent. Excellent. Um, and there's the implication. There's the implication of, of Zazzy Beats. Zazzy Beats. Zazzy. Um, there's an implication of Zazzy. Yeah. And there's, um, well, there's a strong implication that the therapist at the end probably meets a gruesome demise. Yeah. But it also happens off screen. Yeah. Um, and I'm not saying that doesn't make it bad. I'm just saying it, there's no direct glorification or catharsis that comes from him killing people. I don't think he even really experiences catharsis when he kills his mother. Yeah. It seems okay, to be I mean, just an awkward moment for him. Look, I have been in cinemas and had people react very strangely to very different... Mm. People react strangely. I mean, yeah, I, I, it's very interesting what you said about walking out because I, I've assumed now in my own hearing of this story that it was a sense of fear or trepidation that this person... I think it was discomfort. Dangerous. The way it was described to me was just a general sense of huh, discomfort. That's very interesting. And the person she went to see the film with was also very uncomfortable. Hmm. But, but then that can feed off each other. Yeah, well, it, it, it could be a loop. Thing. You could get it could a be feedback a loop. loop. Very interesting. But a fair, apparently a few people walked out. Mm. It was not just uh, herself. I think that's very good for the film. I'm not saying it's a good thing. Well, that's what I mean. I'm saying it's very good for the film. If people are saying, oh, it's so edgy and yeah. dangerous I had to walk out of it I, I'm thinking of The Exorcist now yeah and how The Exorcist mm. caused waves of fear Such and panic hysteria, and, yeah. and it's fine it's just a normal film yeah I do think it I she's... do think it elevates the film to a more mythic art, yeah mythic artistic level yeah. in that it's divisive and that's often what you know the great cult films are they're, they're, they divide audiences and The Exorcist you know, <laughs> the, the Exorcist for one example, but anything that Werner Herzog has ever done. Your mother sucks cocks in hell. <laughs> That's all you wanted to say. That's it this week, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> um, and we're going to leave it on that high note. Um, does your... No, I'm kidding. <laughs> we're not going to ask that question. But it did make me think, Michael, and it did make me pitch a brand new uh, segment for this week's podcast. A brand new segment. Not a brand new segment, but it's a, a the brand theme. new segment song. <laughs> Just want to make a little theme tune? He's got a brand new segment. It's the brand new segment song. Ben's had an idea, and now we're going to talk about all the things that... Ah, I've lost it. I really need to learn how to use, like, GarageBand and stuff like that on mm-hmm. the computer, because I really want to make, like, full songs out it's of your various theme segment tunes. Song. I would absolutely love that. Um, but it got me thinking, Michael, Yeah. because people are so hysteric, not unlike The Exorcist, Yeah. Um, they're saying that this character will Isn't inspire... hysterical, the word? Uh, can we not say hysteric? I don't know. Mm. Usually when you say something wrong and I correct you, I know You're that right. I'm right. Yeah. But I don't know this time. Do you know what we'll I got, look that up after. Do you know what I got wrong once, Michael? Go on. And it just it came back this week because I, I almost did it again. Gargantuous. Gargantuan. Yeah, it's gargantuan. Gargantuous yeah. isn't a word. No, I, it sounds like something you might make up. Yeah, it's weird, isn't it? Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Go on, anyway. Anyway, sorry, that was a weird segue. Uh, welcome back to Lexicon Corner, uh, yeah. where we take a look at all the terms that confuse people in the world. Mostly Ben. Um, specifically <laughs> being one. Uh, yeah, very good. Specifically Ben. Look, um, let's not let this get too pejorative. Let's just move on with, <laughs> move on with the podcast and talk about what you're going to say. So it got me thinking because so many people are saying that it's going to influence people and he's a really toxic role model for some yep. people because that is some of the criticism the film's getting. Yep. Who are the good and bad role models that people choose from pop culture, Michael? Exactly, Ben. And we, we, do you know what we did this week, Michael? We put up a oh, rhetorical you, well, you or... Can you no, can well, you, no, you, oh, you did. Can no, no, look, 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 you, look, you did it. So you, you go talk about it. Do you know what we did, Michael? What we did was, right? We took, no, go on. No, you do it. Go on. You go on. <laughs> we put up a little poll on yeah, the we did. gram of Insta. Yeah. The L instantaneous gram. Is that what it stands for? Yes, almost certainly. Um, and uh, we asked our listeners, and our listeners, my goodness, Michael. What does the gram and Instagram stand for? Telegram of some Is kind. it? Instagram, I'm okay, assuming. Yeah. I don't know. I oh. say that with full confidence, but I often say things in full confidence and I'm proven wrong later. I know that about you, Ben. So yes, do the listeners. It's, it's your, <laughs> that the listeners know completely, but they do now. Come on. Um, get, to the, get to the point. Anyway, get to the meat anyway, of the issue. So we asked, yeah. who, uh, who's your fictional role model right Michael and we got a bloody a plethora a heft of responses from both inside the fan base and outside our regular fan base which I, I was very you, happy about the way you said that I thought you were going to say from both incels and regular people <laughs> because as we know I represent the incel end of yep. the podcast and Michael incel represents the regular folk yep. um, 
if there are any incels listening, it's okay. Let's just <laughs> just find a bit of hope. <laughs> you know, it'll be, it'll be grand. It'll be grand. Well, does he be so look after? Does he be? Oh, Benjamin. Oh, should, do you want to get the ball rolling, or shall I get the ball rolling? Go on, you tell me yours, Michael, because you didn't answer a poll. I right didn't now. answer the poll. Yeah, because I, I had a bloody think. A bloody I, had a, I had a very thorough think about this, to be honest with you, because. Um, all we are, Ben, really, is a collection of our influences. That's all we are, Michael. And I got to thinking, and I, I think I made a chronology of my influences. Yes. I think. Go on. And I think the first one that I strongly remember feeling that I wanted to be like was Hank the Ranger from the Dungeons & Dragons TV show, uh, animated series. Really? Yes. Who is Hank the Ranger? Do you not do you remember the series? No, I don't. It's about six teens. Okay. Now they they're teens, but they look like bloody adults. They're twenty eight year old American teens. Like yeah, but it's animated, so <laughs> they are teens. So it's about six teens who go on a Dungeons and Dragons roller coaster, and it takes them to the land of Dungeons and Dragons. Is this guy? That guy there, yeah. Hmm. Um, and Hank was the oldest, I think. I think he was 15. Okay. And the rest were all 14, 15, 13, 11. And he was the kind of de facto leader. He was the Leonardo. This is very, this is very telling. <laughs> but hold on. This gets even better. I'm about to this summarize is, my entire is, personality here. He, he's the de facto leader because he's the oldest, I think. Okay. And he is the classic Leonardo from the Turtles, Cyclops from the X-Men. Yeah. You know, he's the one who's like, we have to do this the right way, everybody. Come on, let's do it the right way, you sons of bitches. Very telling. Very telling, right? So he was, also he had the coolest weapon. He had a bow and arrow. He had a bow which shot magic arrows. He oh, didn't need arrows. Get in. It didn't even have a string. Oh, you could just, you could just flex the hand um, back. Flex the hand back and shoot magic arrows Saved at dragons. Saved a lot of time on animation. That was a good choice. For and the arrows. And dragon. <laughs> Very good. Yeah, so when I was young, Ben, I wanted to be called Hank. I didn't. Oh. I didn't know it was short for Henry. Oh, thank God! And an old man name. Yeah, no. <laughs> an old American man. It's... Yeah, so he was my he was my first influence, Ben. Aww. And then after that, and this Ooh. is I think just as telling, Ben. It's another animated series, but a bit later. I think the next character who most influenced me was Beast. From Hank Nick. McCoy, another Hank. <laughs> Which is a bit weird. Okay. Uh, All right. Beast influenced me, Ben, to the point where I think that I used to... No, I know this for a fact. I, on more than one occasion, said, based on my calculations, blah, blah, blah. Little surprise here, Ben. I hadn't done any calculations. No. I don't think no. I even knew what it really meant. No. But I like the idea of being the kind of... The, the, nerd, the nerdy, nerdy one. one the nerdy <laughs> one who did the calculations oh, but also could do a kick and whatnot. do a kick yeah. he's good he could hold yeah. his own yeah so I mean Ben I, I don't know if it would be surprising for you to find out that I became a large hairy man with a background in science yeah no <laughs> <laughs> that, that reads that yeah. was, that was that, my goodness isn't that weird you were you were role modeled the fuck out that's of that's kind of that's my early childhood yeah. influences I yeah think. it also oh. explains why you say fascinating it does all the time. It? And yeah. I'm always bloody hanging upside down and reading a book. Yeah, but the, if I could, if I had a nickel for every time I came into this tiny room and you were hanging upside down reading a book, <laughs> I'd be in the wrong country. You'd be like Vicky Vale in Batman 1989, because <laughs> he does it as well. He does the same does thing because he's doing the he's doing the he's sit ups upside Batman, down. Yeah. He's Batman. Well, he's, he's not doing sit ups though. See, Michael did. Keaton has never done a sit up in his life. Oh, as you know. No, as you know. Did you ask him that personally? Or? Yeah, <laughs> okay. we're in a club. The Michaels. The Michaels. <laughs> yeah. The Michael's of pop culture. We have a WhatsApp group. <laughs> Michael Jordan's in there as well. Is he alive? Yeah, he's alive. Yeah, yeah. he's still going. He's yeah. still going. Bit of a dick, apparently, but he's still going. Yeah. Uh, I've got a few more, but... I'll go on. Th- no, you, you go. You, you, why don't you just... Uh, for me, one of the big ones was Indiana Jones. I just thought Indiana Jones was a badass when I was a kid. So I just thought he was great, and he always got out of scrapes, and I just thought it was great. Um, I liked that he always... Had a plan. I liked that he was always able to move. And I suppose because I wasn't a very athletic child, it was just something that was very aspirational for me. I was like, oh, mm. he's such an able-bodied individual. And he was a doctor and he was smart and he could do all these things as well. And he was a hit with the ladies. He was a hit with the ladies. Well, one of the things that Indiana Jones does came through for me, but about nothing else. Um, I don't have a whip. He had a whip. And I can't wear a hat for shit. What do you mean you can't wear a hat? I don't wear a hat well. I have big ears. <laughs> they stick out. 
<laughs> they, they, they need to be pinned. My ears need to. My ears need a pin. Um, another person that I was mad about, and I put it on the Instagram. There was Artemis Fowl. I only ben, thought about it. I have never read a touch about Artemis Fowl, and you know, Ben, that our listenership is about thirty percent Irish, sixty percent international. Yes. So I think you might have to tell us who even is Artemis Fowl. I mean, the good news. in a little bit more depth than. Hank the Ranger, or fair Beast. enough. So there's everyone knows who Beast is. Here he is. Here, look. No, that's Linda. Linda, 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 Linda. Linda. That's bloody great action figure. Linda. Linda the police woman. Linda the police woman. This episode is so rambly. Um, um, yeah, go on, sorry. So, Owen Colfer is a relatively successful author here. Relatively in successful. Our, well, as, well as, as successful as an Irish author can be. Although the book oh, has hey. been sold internationally quite hey. quite far and wide. What do you, hold Disney's, on a minute. Disney's making a movie of it in 2020. Yeah, what do you mean movie's been that, made. as successful as an Irish author can be, Ben? You're talking about the home of Oscar Wilde. Yeah, but they're all James dead. Joyce. Uh, George Bernard Shaw. George Bernard Shaw. <laughs> yeah. Um, that fella who wrote about all the sad drunk people Brendan Bean yes that's who I meant <laughs> no, Brendan Bean was a sad drunk person yeah but uh, he also wrote about but them, yeah alright fair enough fair enough anyway he wrote a series of children's books called Artemis Fowl and it's about I suppose it'd be what happened if Bruce Wayne went the other way um, as a young fella he's a hyper intelligent criminal mastermind at the age of 11 oh um, and that's, I thought he was a skeleton no that's Skullduggery Pleasant oh. and that's by Derek Landy who is another influence that we'll get to later. Okay. Um, but uh, yeah, that's Skullduggery Pleasant by uh, Derek Landy. Another hugely successful children's series from Ireland. Um, Ireland. Same with Darren Shan. Darren Shan's from Limerick. Who's Darren uh, Shan? He wrote all the Vampire Chronicles and stuff like that. Uh, he's a big children's author. Ch- uh, we've, we've come from the greats of Oscar Wilde. Bloody James Joyce. Uh, George Bernard Shaw. George Bernard Shaw. <laughs> George Bernard Shaw. Um, and we've gone into children's publishing. It's a whole thing. There's nothing but wrong anyway, with children's books. His mother is um unfortunately has suffered from massive PTSD. His father is missing. I'll give him beast to kind of jazz um, hands, pose. And <laughs> Artemis Fowl is obsessed with finding the fairy folk of Ireland. Oh. Um and he tracks them down through criminal enterprise and he has a whole interaction because fairies have kept their existence secret for thousands of years and Artemis Fowl is threatening all that. He's a hyper intelligent young man. Um, so and they're very the well written. He's the bad guy. Duh. Oh. Do, 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 Very good, yeah. Um, he's the baddie. Yeah. I thought he was the goodie. No, he's the mega baddie. Who's the... Uh, and the protagonist of this The protagonist story. would be Holly Short, who's the the police officer, the fairy police officer sent to stop him. Oh. And over the series of the books, he's redeemed, and they become besties. And it's, it's a great series. Oh. Um, and I actually what, thoroughly recommend it. Go on then. In what sense was it an inspiration to young men? Um, I just liked how capable that 11-year-old young man was. Um, and again, I really, 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 really liked um, the sense of him taking advantage of people because they thought he was so young. Right. So he would often trick them into to helping him because he would pretend to be an 11 year old child. It's very manipulative. But he is an 11 year old child. Um, yeah, but he pretended to have the, the average intelligence and capability of an 11 year old child, which was far advanced. He also had a butler called Butler. Um, oh, very, very clever. Because Butler is a traditional Irish name and it makes yeah. a little bit of sense. Yeah. Um, and his butler was trained all over the world in different kind of. Like Alfred. Uh, yeah, not to, unlike that. But I would say. Is he that in the SAS? I would say that it might have been stolen from. I think they might have stolen the new Alfred. Alfred from Get these books where he was a big badass butler and butler was great I just well, really enjoyed that friendship but he was also a very lonely child Michael and it was interesting to read that put across in a children's book I think they're very healthy books for, for young men and women in terms of learning your place and what you're allowed to surely do surely you weren't a lonely child Ben I've met your family no I was a very busy child met but, your brother but uh, you've met my brother yeah, you've, nice you've seen my mother yeah. seen my father never seen your sister ah you'll see her eventually She'll never seen any soon. evidence of this sister no, that she exists. allegedly exists she exists hmm. Ben yeah of course uh, wasn't Cato a, a kick-ass butler as well yeah oh, so, sure look, look. But, but kick-ass butlers go away back. kick-ass butlers galore do you know Ben who my next in my kind of line of I would say Ben there are people who know me well who might listen to this who might say You've forgotten someone. Oh, Which okay. would be interesting if people you know and love were to say, you were clearly influenced by this person. You liar. Okay, I'm excited now. <laughs> no, but I, I don't know. No, I, what, someone I, this is this is a bad period. This is a very bad period. This, this speaks more to fashion 
and hairstyle. Oh, no. And, no, this is very bad. I don't even want to talk about it's this. It's too late now. I know. When I was approaching the Maybe approaching the end of secondary school, so 15, okay. 16. Okay. Maybe heading towards the beginning of university. Okay. I thought that the personification of how to be a cool guy oh, no. was David Boreanaz as Angel. Oh, no one would blame you. It's, it's, it, it, this is what I mean, though, by sometimes we, we pick the wrong <laughs> role models. <laughs> um, but yet, no one would blame you, Michael. Go on, tell us more. Well, look, Ben, this was kind of my my pop cultural introduction to what a cool guy who ladies wanted was. Yeah, because you're so, you're sold that on television. Because that's what you're sold. That's what, he, that's what people want. Everyone wants this broody guy with the spiky blonde hair and the bloody long jackets. And Ben, I tried to grow angel hair for probably really? three years. I'll tell you what, Ben, I have naturally curly hair. That's tough. You try and get this to bloody stick up in the air like a 90s boy band member. Mm, not going to happen. You know what it's going to look like? It's going to look like a greasy mop. Yeah. And that's what it was. Aww. So it, I could keep it I could keep it sticking up like Angel if I left it under, let's say, five or six centimeters. Okay. But once it went past that, it was going to curl. You had a flop over. Now, here's the problem, Ben. Go on. If you were a man of a blonde hair and a blue eye. Yeah. And you grow your hair and spike it up. You do not look like David Boreanaz playing the character Angel. You look like a member of the band The Proclaimers. No, 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 no. That's the ones, yeah. <laughs> Close enough. And yeah, so Angel was responsible for a lot of suffering in my life, to be honest. Oh, <laughs> you all right? No, it's not. They brought that back. <laughs> <laughs> it's painful. Um, to be fair, that's one of the interesting things that we want to talk about here, though, is sometimes you can be completely misled by television and movies. Because very often, the, the, the sexy brooding man in the leather jacket isn't real and no woman actually wants that. No, they don't. that's not what they want. Past the first five minutes. Like, well, they, they might do if they look if he looks like David Boreanaz. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, but 16-year-old me did not look like David Boreanaz. I, I can also almost guarantee that uh, Irish women at that time I did not fancy people that looked like David Boreanaz. Ah, I'd say they did. Ah, they didn't. Get out Maybe they here. didn't. Maybe I'm still betraying my influences here. Mm, fair enough. Uh, no, David was good. David was handsome. Don't say anything He's about handsome David. Handsome man. Leave David alone. But we put it out to our, our listeners as well. We got a, we got a, a, a bevy. A bevy of influences. A bloody bevy. Go on. Um, some of the ones that we got, I did not know at all. Um, Tannis Half-Elven, for example, and Wang Fei-Hung. Um, Wang Fei Hung is a martial artist, famous martial artist that kind of inspired lots of martial arts movies and things like that. He was a trainer for many years, a folk hero in, in China, and that was sent into us by Lights, Camera, Tentacles. Tanis Half Elven, yeah. uh, who was another character that was sent into us by Lights, Camera, Tentacles on Instagram, um, who is, I had no idea who this was, so I had to look it up, but it's a fictional Half Elven character in the Dragonlance series of books. Dragons. Um, Wizards that, of the Coast. Is that a Dungeons and Dragons thing? I don't know if it's a Dungeons and Dragons thing. It's uh, there are Dungeons and Dragons though. Yeah, it's Wizards of the Coast. So I think it's Magic the Gathering. Magic the Gathering. Is that is what Wizards it is? If it's yeah. if it's that. Although um, by Hasbro. So he was a character in that. Well, well, what sort of characteristics does and Tannis, enough, a half elven have? Just seeing it here in the cartoon, he's what? played by Michael Rosenbaum. <laughs> which oh is, really? Which is odd. How how serendipitous, Michael. How serendipitous. Yeah. Um, so let's take a look at him again. What sort of characteristics do these characters have? What does this tell us about the personality of one Lights Camera Tentacles? Well, first of all, we're not going to psychoanalyze our, our listeners because uh, we want to make sure they keep listening. But these would all be <laughs> these would all be warriors of some kind, Michael, ah, by the looks of things. Another one that Light Camera Tentacles sent into us was Ellen Ripley. Ellen Ripley's a good shout. Which I, which I first of all commend for the fact that he's a man and yeah. he admires a female character, which is absolutely the way we should be treating this. So, well done, Lights, Camera, Tentacles. Uh, and second, they're all a bit badass. They're all a bit badass, Michael. All a bit badass. Everyone's a badass now. Everyone's a badass now, except for me. And that's why I do this end of the podcast. Um, <laughs> we got some other unusual ones. Uh, on. One of the ones that we had sent in from someone um, in our previous lives was Ezio Auditore and Cesar Borgia. <laughs> Which I found very entertaining. Who was um, who this someone in our previous Ezio, life? Ezio Auditore um, oh, yeah, is okay. from Assassin's Creed 2. I think you can read the username. Caesar, yeah, it's uh, it was sent in by Nastya Galinka. Yeah. Um, and um, she really enjoys their characteristics. She thinks they're very ambitious and very strong. Aren't and, they both kind of real, assassins? Real bad eggs. Real bad Are eggs. Bad eggs? But I, um, I did, I did slag this particular listener by saying such intense role models, um, and they really are. But look, 
It's Do you a, want to point out that for non-Irish listeners, what slag means? Oh, sorry, yeah. Uh, insult in a teasing manner, not meant to hurt, but rather to jape. Yeah, it, for the Americans, it would be to make fun of. To make fun of. For the British, it would be to tease. To tease, yes. But for us, it's to slag. To slag. Um, yeah. Um, you slag, Ben. And then, <laughs> you slag. And then, of course, uh, one of the ones ben, that we got from... I've not played much of the, the Assassin's Have series. You not? No. I've not played any of it. Would you like me to? Really? Are they? Are they? Let's spend. Look, you were all excited about your bloody D and D. My little alignment chart. chart. Oh, I'm very excited. Where about. would those characters appear on a? Well, first of all, Ben, tell us what is a bloody D and D alignment chart. So this is a, a meme that kind of became a huge template. I think it wasn't a meme previous to that. I think alignment charts have always been part of of D and D culture, um, but they became a meme a couple of years ago when. Various people became famous through media or whatever, and people would put them on a little alignment chart. So generally, an alignment chart has nine boxes, yeah. um, and the boxes run a little bit like this, Michael. You have lawful, uh, good, neutral, good, chaotic, well, good. You have you have a basically you have a scale from lawful to chaotic, yeah, and you have a scale from good to evil. That's better, and they intersect. That's better. Yeah, yeah. So you have overlaps um, and things like this, and it kind of helps you to distinguish where a character lies. Um, in their allegiances or their Mor- alignment their morality their morality is a test um, and one of our listeners suggested that we take a look at something like that and that was, was of course Cadwell? it was Dr. Cadwell it was Dr. Cadwell he said can I add our dent to that list for me what links them all is they have an ethical code that may not be formalised in words or texts but does good and limit their actions so lawful neutral perhaps in D&D terms and that got me thinking Michael that got me thinking, yes. that might be a good way to look at this and why they influence people in different ways. Right. Um, so I made ourselves, mm-hmm. and they'll be able to see it on the gram when you're listening. Yes. Uh, I made a little uh, Michael and Benjamin's D&D Michael alignment Michael chart D&D. for different characters. Do you want to take a look at it there, Michael? I'll bloody take a look at it for you there, Ben. Here you go. Okay. You take a look at it. Yeah, look, Ben, you've put here, uh, and again, most of these people, there's bloody Batman. Look, I'm... I'm Fully welcoming, by the way. Any disagreement, any realigning, because I'm not so good at D and D alignment no, charts. I'm you put <laughs> you put Indy at ca- chaotic good. Yeah, I thought he was a bit chaotic good. Because he doesn't follow the law. Doesn't follow the law at all. But he d- he does things for the overall greater good. He also doesn't have a really strict code because you'll notice in the famous scene where there's a man swinging the sword around in traditional you movies, he'd have fine. I'll do it with my fists. Yeah. But he doesn't. He bloody bloody gives him a bullet instead. You've put Nick Fury as lawful neutral. Yes, because lawful neutral is ambiguous in terms of a code, but they'll do whatever it takes to be. Like he's lawful, he follows rules. Yes, he has a. He, he... But sometimes it's bloody shady rules, mm. Michael. Sometimes shady rules. Um, you will be able to see this on our Instagram. We're putting it up. Um, what well, is now yesterday evening? There's Catwoman. Um, Catwoman. I put Catwoman in for Michael specifically, um, just to make him happy. Very good. Um, in lawful good, we have Batman, um, because yeah. one of our listeners, Infinity Action Art, longtime listener of the podcast. Um, gave us a shout about Batman, um, specifically Batman from the animated series, who he thinks is bloody great. Yes. Well, he is a good character influence, isn't he? Probably, he? probably one of the best Batmans in your in your excellently de- in your excellent deconstruction of yes. Batman as a pretty poor character in a modern context. Oh yeah, I took, um, him, I took him down. I think Batman the animated series has a great streamlined version of that character with actual morality and justice mm. and things you can probably aspire to so I was very much on board with that so he's up there as well Batman's after been thrown there into the you've put good. Thanos as neutral evil yeah so this is probably me not understanding the chart properly no well I'm not necessarily disagreeing because Ben also I don't understand the chart very well but I would have said that he's evil sure for sure he's evil is he yeah no, yeah, he no is. he's evil he's definitely evil but he's very lawful yeah, so he has a very strong code, but it's all about balance. But in in that way, Thanos, again, what I understand with the neutral thing is they are not bothered by the morality of their own actions as long as it serves the purpose that they're going for. So I chose evil neutral because he'll do a good thing if it makes him get the stones faster or he'll just do a really bad thing. If it but makes he's, him get the but stones he's getting the stones faster to do a good thing. Well, I mean, that, as far as that, he understands, as it. far as he understands it, yeah. Do you, do you think that mm. Thanos is an inspiration to Greta Grunberg? <laughs> he's, he's at heart an environmentalist, Ooh. isn't he? I mean, that's what the internet says. Thanos <laughs> did nothing wrong. He's one of the most popular Reddits in existence. Is it? Um, yeah, Thanos did nothing wrong. He's that's not what a it's good called. Bloke, he's not a good bloke. Not really. It's it's a complicated thing. But look, when you see this on the the Instagram. 
do yeah. let us know what you thought. Um, I have, of course, some of the classics. I think the, the go-to one that you'll see in any D&D alignment chart when you look it up is uh, for Chaotic Evil, you've got the Joker yeah. from The Dark Knight. Um, lawful Evil, I chose Darth Vader. Because yeah, he follows a very strict code. Yeah, and he's, well, he's, he's sent to different places to a, do... He's a, bloody, he's a bloody bureaucratic bad guy. Yeah, he's yeah, a bloody he's, he's a bureaucrat. Yeah. The whole empire is bureaucrat. Although he did kill all those kids. He, he did, all the younglings. That wasn't great. All the younglings. That was hard to redeem. Yeah. Although it was off screen, like in Joker. It was off screen. Maybe they were fine. Maybe they were all fine. They weren't fine. They weren't. They were all fine. Um, and then, of course, uh, right at the top there, I put Dr. Cadwell's suggestion for neutral good. Bloody Arthur Dent from The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. A lot of people said... Um, we had a few other suggestions, Ben. We got well, Leonardo from the Turtles. Yeah, classic bloody leader yeah. complex there. Yeah. yeah. Good stuff. Uh, hey, <laughs> hey now. Wait a um, minute. Wait a minute. I always disliked the kind of difficult, rebellious... I, I never liked Raphael. Okay. In order of favourite turtles, it was probably Michelangelo. Then Donatello and Leonardo kind of tied... And then Raphael can suck an egg. But Michael, you stop don't, making trouble, Raphael. You don't like. It's you, always your fault. You don't like an aggressive person. You you are you are yourself, Michael, uh, a committed um, a committed pacifist. Except you can kick people's asses. Well, look, um, I but I, I, I don't think you I don't I think you like know. an aggressive an aggressive individual, Michael. You'll notice that Beast being one of the stronger X Men in terms of physical strength and stuff like that. Not a dick. No, he's Notably, a real good guy. Not a dick. He's a real nice bloke. Um, Kelsey Grammer. Kelsey Grammer. That was good casting at the yeah. time. Bloody, um, bloody great casting. Love I think scrambled eggs. <laughs> Baby, I hear the blues are calling. Uh, Tell us more about some of the listeners. We've some of the some of the other things that we got. Oh, we're we're uh, rambling now. Darren wrote into us for Billy Cranston from Mighty Morphin Power Rangers. But Billy Cranston has a lot of the beast going on about. A lot of the beast going blue. on. He's uh, the nerdy one. His exact argument was he made me, uh, he made being a nerd look cool. He proved that you don't have to be one of the cool kids to fit in and have friends. He was proof that anyone can be a hero. Plus, as a, uh, for a geek, he was gorgeous, which is good. Although, I mean, tragically, in a lot of sense, he was bullied off the show. Was he? The actor who played Billy, yeah. Oh. There's a kind of a dark backstory to that, unfortunately. But yeah, Billy was a great character. Oh, no. I think Billy was another, according to my calculations, guy. Oh yeah, well, look, look, <laughs> for sure. Needless to say, Mick is going on a bloody mighty more from Power Rangers binge after this. Try and get some new catchphrases for the next pod. Um, another one that we had from completely outside of our fan base, Michael. Someone just found the hashtag and decided to Very answer good. our post. It was uh, Cosmic Marvel on Instagram. Uh, both the Hawkeyes, Ferris Bueller, Chandler Bing, and heck, most of the Doctors and companions from Doctor this Who. It's a bit of a chaotic there, isn't it? Yeah, there? The, I think the Doctor is absolutely chaotic. Good. Yeah, he's just a, he's there's just a bit of chaos there. But he roaming around, sticking his oar in things. And so. both Hawkeyes too are a bit kind of grim yeah. and dirty and low down and, and on the side of good overall. Chandler Bing is just chaotic good all over. Yeah. Does the right thing, but at what point? Huge role model though. I didn't think of Chandler Bing until the thing, but like a lot of my sarcasm would come from from what I observed in Chandler Bing. From Ms. Chandler Bong. <laughs> I strongly recommend, Ben, that you watch some Friends bloopers. They are funnier than the, sh- than the series. They probably are at this point. Possibly also less homophobic and racist. Ah, look, um, ben, it was the 90s. Yeah, and then it, that got me thinking about David Tennant. I bloody love David Tennant. And it would have been around my 15, 16-year-old self that fell in love with someone like David Tennant, all his enthusiasm and energy and stuff like that. And that's probably been very formative for me, Michael. And that's why your favourite character is Kilgrave. Kilgrave, the purple man. bloody great. Yeah, um, big influence on you. But, oh, my God. <laughs> this, this new Ben's and Incel thing is going to have to go. <laughs> no, I like it. I don't, know if I, love it. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if I love it. Polka Dot Sundays, Ben, shows a lot of uh, a lot of ladies. George from The Famous Five, who I've, I'm told is a lady I, having a boy's name. Yeah, I didn't cop that at all. Apparently, she's strong and tough and takes no guff. Strong and tough and takes no guff. You should put that I've on just, a t-shirt. I think I've just invented that, but I might have stolen it from Dane Cook. No, you definitely uh, did. Veronica Mars, ah, the queen of the verbal takedown. Queen of the verbal takedown. And of course, Mabel from our, our favourite show, uh, Bloody Gravity Falls. Mabel's an interesting one. I find that really interesting that some people find new role models in their older age. Hey, <laughs> she's going to love that. Huh? <laughs> she's going to love that. In older age, not yeah. old age. Yeah, older age. Yeah, that's... Uh, uh, dig, dig well, up. Well, that's going to that's gonna get my teeth knocked use, in, but use, that's okay. use those biggish hands to dig yourself out of the hole not further anyway, into it anyway I find it interesting that even when childhood has passed for certain people they find new kind of um, role models or things like that um, with that in mind ladies and gentlemen is there anyone that you have been particularly influenced by in the last 10 years is there anyone who's who's really kind of caught your attention in a, a fictional sense are you a fan of Captain America perhaps a Robert Downey Jr Robert Downey something Jr something like that um, 
Are you a fan of Kilgrave? We hope not. Um, but if you are, let I us think Star Lord has influenced me a lot. But I think, I think that I think that Ben Marvel did Star Lord dirty. In the in the new one, yeah, they, he, the got a, he got a raw, movie, he's got, he's got, a, got a, real a raw, raw deal. deal. He's, he's just, just a buffoon all of yeah. a sudden. He was a very competent guy in the first ones, and sometimes his buffoonery was kind of an act. Yeah, and then all of a sudden, no, they did him dirty. They did as him the dirty. Young say. So Infinity yeah, War and bloody Endgame. Endgame. Star Lord needs a. It's just a bit a, of a, a new Guardians I'd say of the James Gunn. Redeeming. We see. I think probably originally when James Gunn was out, maybe Marvel was just like, well, let's let's sideline that character a little bit. Let's... I think they wrote Infinity War and filmed it even possibly before that all happened. Oh, okay. Never mind. I then. think it's just, just Chris Pratt likes playing a buffoon. He's just good at it. He likes being the butt of the joke. He shouldn't be though. He was a good Not character. Always. He's a good character. Anyway, who are you influenced by? Who Drax. makes you tick? You are Drax. You often stand there and eat crisps pretending to be invisible. Um, it's a whole thing that I did. Scared the shit out of me one of the days. It was awful. Anyway, <laughs> he's doing it right now, ladies and gentlemen. So I'm going to do the wrap up while he's invisible and practicing. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you want to get in touch with us, if you have an idea for a podcast, if there's a topic you'd like covered, get in touch with us. We have our own website, seanrebeag.com. S-E-O-M-R-A-B-E-A-G dot com. It means tiny room in Irish. It means tiny room in Irish. Uh, we are on Instagram. You can find most of our day-to-day content up there. Um, you can always listen to our episode. If you want a little bit more in-depth in the world of comic books and things like that, check out our other podcast, Collecting Issues, which Collecting will be issues. out this Wednesday if you're listening on Monday. So get involved with that. The Immortal Hulk. Pick up your copy now. You still have time. Volume one. Volume one. Or is is he, he both? Um, and uh, yeah, let us know what you think. If you enjoyed the episode, if you think it's good content, if you've been frequently enjoying our episodes, please, please, please give us an hour review on Apple Podcasts um, and follow us on Spotify. That would be great for us. If you're listening to us for on the metrics, YouTube, for the metrics, for the pure metrics of it. Um, if you are on YouTube, give us now a comment. Let us know what you think. And a like, share and subscribe goes a long way. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye. Don't be influenced by Ben.